Yeah, how are everyone so much for joining us tonight? Uh, it is, it's Wednesday evening, December 15th. I can't even believe it. We're already near the end of 2021. I don't, I want to freak anyone out here, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's so crazy to me that we're already at December 15th. Uh, we're here with our next installment of the Anxa U Coffee Time series. And tonight we're extra blessed to be with um, three incredible and powerful leaders of our ANCSA uh, Education and Cultural Heritage Foundations. Um, and uh, we're just gonna have a good conversation about their work, about what they, uh, what they envision for where we're going in the future and, and just whatever comes up as we have this, this coffee time conversation. So for those of you who are joining us on the Facebook live stream, grab some coffee, grab some tea, grab some nooks or snacks and join us as we have this conversation tonight. Uh, my name is Lagunai, uh, Liz Medicine Crow. I'm a uh, Thinged in Haida. I come from um, Haida Gwaii, Hik de Hanlai, uh, um, and also here at home in Tih Kwan, in the heart of Thinged Ani. I am a Raven Kach Adi on my Thinged side, uh, freshwater Mark Sakai salmon. And on my, um, on my Haida side, I am an Eagle Chichkit Ne, and our crest is the hummingbird. Um, and tonight I get to co-host with my sister in this work, um, Ayu Kasatak, and I'll hand it to her so she can introduce herself. I am Ayu Kasatak. I come from Umulaflek, also known as Umuklit. The background behind me is about two hours upriver from Umulaflek at my grandparents' fish camp. I am currently zooming in from Den Ina Lands in Degaya Kak, also known as Anchorage. And I serve as vice president um, for First Alaskans Institute where I've been for almost 12 years now. Kind of crazy to think of that. But I'm really excited and looking forward to our conversation. Hello, uh, Susan Anderson here. Um, my family uh, is originally from Wrangell and Juneau, actually down there. Um, I am uh, blessed to be living here in Anchorage on the land of the Denina, and uh, I lived in Seward for quite a long time as well, um, also known as Kutuchak. And uh, I am lucky enough to be with the Siri Foundation, and I get to be the fairy godmother, <laughs> um, and have been for, for quite some time. And I am very excited to just have a conversation with everyone this evening. Ganeshish. To my hui Alicia Town Spain, Sialami Suthlianga, Kitakwithmi Tahtwa, Emachka Oga Rimi, Pilot Point Me Suthlia, Apalka Bart Rimi, Oklahoma, Tamathlia, Mamaka Ingrid Hansen, Pilot Point Me Suthlia, Olympia Washington Me Atahtuk, Dadaka Randy Towns, San Antonio, Texas Me Suthlia, Issaquah, Washington, me, Atahtuk, Ilanka, Igashik, Mute, Shelly, American Sat, and Lijustra, Alutik, Sun, Sukoyana, Sinak. I am Alicia Towns Bain. I was born in Seattle and I live here in Anchorage on the land of the Dena'ina. My grandmother was Olga Rimi and she was born in Pilot Point. Alaska in the Bristol Bay region. My grandfather was Bert Remy from Oklahoma. My mom is Ingrid Hansen. She was also born, born in Pilot Point and now she lives in Olympia. And my dad is Randy Towns. He's from San Antonio, Texas. Um, kind of halfway between was where I was raised in Seattle and now he lives in Issaquah. Um, and my family is from um, Agashik, which is how we would say Pilot Point. Um, in Alutic and also kind of American, so lower 48. And I've been working in the last year to learn our Alutic language, my Alutic language, and it's um, been such a blessing and also like really good and powerful work. So Koyana Snack for allowing me to introduce myself fully in that way. Um, I also serve uh, as the executive director of the BBNC Education Foundation. I'm going into my 
uh, just about almost five years in that role. And I feel really humbled and blessed to be able to um, sit with all of you tonight, and especially um, these two leaders that I consider, you know, just awesome um, people that I really aspire to be around and with. And I am really excited to learn and listen as much as I as I talk tonight. So thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you, most noble people. Shangu Kwedi Ayahat, Just Kat Kwan Ayahat, Kalbi Yayi Hit Ayahat, Tukha Hadi Dachhunk Ayahat. My Tlingit names are Yedektazak, it's an ancient name, the meaning has been lost. And my ceremonial name is Kahani, and it comes from a historic event when we used to trade with the interior uh, Tlingit people, and we would trade rifles for furs, we would stand the rifle up and uh, our, our trading partners would have to stack up furs up to the height of the, of the rifle. And so my, and it means woman who stands in the place of a man. And uh, having served on the Sea Alaska board for 30 years when it was predominantly men, which has changed, uh, I would have to remind them of that. Uh, I am I am Eagle from the Thunderbird clan and the House Lord from the Sun in Klukwan. I'm also a Chilkat and I am a grandchild of the Flukahadi or the uh, Sakai Sakai salmon. Um, in English, I'm Rosita Whirl and I serve as president of the Sea Alaska Heritage uh, Institute, which keeps me very busy. How uh, to all three of you for sharing your time with us tonight uh, for uh, for this conversation. We started having these Anxi U conversations about the middle of November, kind of kicking off leading up to this week, um, with December 18th being um, the date that Anxa was signed into law um, back in 1971. A full disclaimer, I was born December 25th, 1971. <laughs> so I'm just a tad bit younger than ANCSA itself as, as a law. Um, the reason we wanted to host these coffee times was to give people an opportunity to hear and learn more about ANCSA from different points of view, from different people's experiences, and from the different kinds of work that happens because of um, because of this legislation. And one of the most critical parts of our lives as Native peoples is who we are, our connection to who we are, um, our cultural strength, our understanding of our responsibilities, um, that we are a collective peoples and that we are not just individuals. And part of, um, Part of uh, the thing that we tell folks when they're trying to understand our native peoples across the state is that if you really, if you really want to know our peoples, you have to understand, um, you have to understand the things that we care about most. Those are our children and our ways of life. And the work that the three of you are engaged in, I think is really important for people to have a chance to hear it from your own perspectives and voices. So I wanna ask a question. I'll ask the question and invite you folks to uh, think about it and, um, and hopefully one of you would like to, uh, would like to respond first. Um, but in, in terms of your own experience and perspective, what is the work of ANCSA Education and Cultural Heritage Foundations, like the ones that you work for? Um, Anyone you want to kind of jump in and share your thoughts on that? Oh, I'd be glad to uh, start it off. Jeez. And, um, well, there, there are multiple things. First of all, you know, Congress, you know, knew that Native corporations were going to be different, even though, you know, their intent was to assimilate Native people with land, corporations, and, and uh, money. But in the findings, it also said that um, Native corporations should uh, promote the social and economic well-being of 
of Native people. So that social aspect, you know, so there was the recognition that Native corporations were going to be different. But it actually, I think, came from our own people that they saw Native corporations as responsible for, uh, for cultural survival of, of, our, of our societies. And in Southeast Alaska, it was actually um, the elders who came to knocking at the door of Sea Alaska. And um, they said, and I just love to repeat this, because they said, our hands are growing weary of holding on to our culture. And they said, our children are learning in new ways. They're not sitting around the fire. They're not always going out hunting and fishing with uncle or spending their times with aunties learning. And they knew that they were learning in different ways. And they, they you know, I, when I, they said that, I was wondering, uh, as I was reading it, were they abdicating their cultural responsibilities? And I came to realize what they were saying was that our children are learning in new ways. They are learning in schools. And those schools, if you recall, you know, in the 70s and 80s, were not teaching our, our culture. And in fact, uh, we were still living in an assimilationist uh, policy era. And so um, in their wisdom, they, they directed C. Alaska that it's their responsibility to do something about our cultural survival and our children learning uh, our, our culture. And so Sea Alaska created the Sea Alaska Heritage Foundation as it was known at, uh, in, in 1980. Um, but initially Sea uh, Alaska Heritage was devoted to cultural preservation. And so there was a lot of marvelous work that was done in terms of recording uh, our, our culture, history, oral traditions, all in our native languages and then translating it uh, into English. So we have great records, you know, of, uh, of um, aspects of our culture. So initially it was cultural preservation, but then um, we, our board of trustees felt that it was time for us to really look at cultural revitalization and, and language revitalization. And so uh, uh, some, 20, some 20 years ago, they changed the mission from just, just uh, preservation to revitalization. And so, I, uh, so you really saw a shift in our programming and, and um, a real growth of, of Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. So our, our mission is not only to perpetuate, but to enhance native cultures. And the other element that was added was to promote cross-cultural understanding. And in promoting cross-cultural understanding, that means that we have to educate the non-Native people about Native societies. Because the thinking was that the shame and the suppression of Native cultures came from the outside. And so it became a, a major part of our work was educating the public about Native cultures and the values of Native cultures, you know, that have survived thousands of years. Oh, goodness, Jeez, how, uh, um, you know, I, I think that that's such a really critical point too about that, 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 that burden of oppression came from outside of us. And in responding to it, we responded from a place of education and of outreach and of trying to build people's understanding. I think that's a really kind of powerful insight into the way our people think. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else wanna share their thoughts? Okay, um, well, I just wanted to say thank you to Kahani for sharing that kind of founding story. It was really interesting and it brings to mind, um, you know, each of the education and cultural foundations have their own unique founding stories. And we were all um, founded at different times, you know, from, I think the earliest um, was the Arctic Education Foundation um, in the, you know, very early, uh, eight, or maybe late seventies, early eighties, and then all the way up to um, some of the newer organizations. So it's just interesting to hear, 
you know, what really um, precipitated it. For the BBNC Education Foundation, we didn't come into existence as a private foundation until 1992. But almost from the very beginning of BBNC, there was always a focus around education and providing access for higher education for our students. And we have, I think if you go back in the corporate minutes, you can find the very beginning, they were making scholarship awards um, right there at the corporate board table and making, you know, supporting students um, who were going to go or interested in, in attending um, higher ed education. And then they formalized it, um, you know, with a, with a private foundation a little bit later. Um, and when I've gone back, as I just as I shared at the beginning in my introduction, I'm relatively new to my organization. And so one of the first things that I did was went back to all of our founding board members and those the folks that were there at the beginning when they created um, BB and CEF. And I asked why, like, you know, and I think, you know, I knew why somewhat, but this value of education, valuing education, just runs so deep and so core um, to us as a people and um, wanting in all of its forms, which I thought was really interesting, you know, cultural education, but also this idea of Western education was seen as a tool and really necessary, I think, as folks were um, creating the corporations and understanding that we needed um, folks who could serve as lawyers and accountants and um, CFOs and all of those, you know, careers that would really guide the success of the companies. Um, and so I think it was, you know, pretty tactical, honestly, that we were like, you know, we see that we need we need this, and we were relying on, you know, good you know, good folks, but folks that were not from Bristol Bay um, to initially guide some of that work and they wanted to change that. And so that's why they started funding these scholarships. And then the other thing that one of our elders told me was um, that they recognized for the students who were, were attending school, like, how difficult it was. Like, so when I asked like, why did we do this? She's like, uh, because it was hard. It was hard for students, you know, who are so far away from home that were feeling really, you know, isolated in some ways and then had to worry about kind of the monetary, you know, money on top of that all. Um, they thought we could do this one thing, which is to take some of that financial stress, even a small portion of it from, you know, off of students to allow them to succeed and concentrate in their work. So I, I do think that that's still really core to our mission every day at BBNC <laughs> Education Foundation is to support those students who are, um, you know, at school, giving it their all and, um, you know, doing whatever we can to help that, you know, guarantee, guarantee their success. And we are now leaning more into culture and cultural heritage work, whereas we really started with that scholarship, I think, backbone. Um, we're seeing more and more the need. And, um, honey, it was just as you said, recognizing that our students are learning in different environments. And sometimes that environment now is the K-12 education system. Um, but they're not always, they don't always have the funding or what's needed, um, you know, to buy the things that, you know, would, will help with those teachings. And so that's where we're finding a lot of potential for, for work there. Yeah, I mean, the Siri Foundation started in 1982. Um, and, and even before that, they had been, you know, doing the scholarships from the for-profit <laughs> board table too, I think. And, and then, you know, some of the other nonprofits um, in our region and, the reality is, is we started and we still do, um, you know, majority of our funds focus on scholarships and grants uh, for people to go to school of, of all sorts, um, you know, of schooling, um, be it two year, four year technical, 
Um, we, we literally, you can have, you can get a cultural fellowship. You can learn how to weave. They'll help you, you know, learn how to weave. Um, and, you know, obviously me coming to this work is really personal because, you know, um, I mean, I'm one of the first scholarship recipients of the foundation. And so it is extremely personal and on that side of the house, as well as the culture side, because, you know, my dad literally had his mouth washed out with soap uh, for speaking Klinget and when he was really, really little. So, you know, I don't, I want, I'm not able to introduce myself well, which is why I didn't do it, which I probably should um, more, but, um, but it's, it's really important. Um, we've been able to fund, I think it's like over 17,000 awards in since, since we started giving out scholarships and grants. And that was in 1982. And then I wanna say it's the late eighties that we started doing project grants to promote and perpetuate and help um, culture you know, thrive really. And so I think that the, the focus of all of what we're trying to do, I think we all recognize that we need to know who we are um, and, and be, be grounded in that so that then we have the strength to go out and do things, go off to school, go off to training, go off, um, you know, or just, you know, to be grounded in community and grounded who we are. And, you know, if you don't grow up here in Alaska, that's hard to do. It is difficult. Um, you know, I did get to grow up here um, back in the you know, being in the 70s and 80s. And that was like a crazy time for a variety of reasons. But then when you go away, which I did to go to school, um, you know, and then, and then being away from Alaska and then being able to come back, I tell you, the opportunities that we have here for culture and heritage and, you know, other opportunities, it, it really is amazing with the work, you know, that, that the ANCSA Education uh, Foundations do um, you know, related to culture and heritage and education improvement. And that's really where the project grants are focused that we try and work on improving educational opportunities for Native students, whatever that means, like, you know, zero to five, all the way through to lifelong learning. Um, and then obviously culture and heritage. And we've partnered, um, let's see, Alaska on some, some, um, some art, um, workshops and all kinds of things. So it really is about um, working together, you know, to be able to do that. And I, I think we're doing even more of that. And it's pretty amazing when you think about it. And that's what's happened in the last 50 years of ANCSA. You know, it's because of ANCSA that these exist. Um, and so it's, you know, ANCSA was not the end all be all for a lot of reasons but it certainly has offered some opportunities that, that we wouldn't have had. I was actually reflecting earlier today that um, it was in my early 20s, I had made my way back to school when my mom mentioned that she thought that I might be eligible for scholarship funding through the Surrey Foundation. That led me to seeking the Surrey Foundation out and learning a little bit about the mission and vision, um, and then ultimately being supported by the Surrey Foundation to go back to school, and how um, that experience of working closely with the program officer at TCF, Panine Peterson, at the time, led to her recommending me for an internship at Siri, which I ended up taking in community relations. And that internship was my first experience of working within any Native organization. And it completely changed my world because it, it opened my eyes to the fact that there are people in the world who are entirely focused on our native community and talking about the condition of our native community and working to uplift us. And it was at that time that, you know, I decided I only ever want to work for native organizations from now on. How could I possibly go back after this? And um, following that internship, 
made my way over to work within the Surrey Foundation offices um, in partnership with Cook Inlet Tribal Council. And so I was just reflecting on that today, Susan, and thinking about the many different pathways um, that our foundations and our cultural and heritage institute, cultural and heritage institutes um, create pathways back to who we are. And um, so something that I was thinking about, Susan, you actually just touched on it and you too a little bit, Kahani, around, um, I think we're living in a time right now where the true history of the education system in Alaska, especially as it relates to our native people, is becoming more visible. And that history, it's like we're pulling back the veil on how the education system, you know, in its formation was really kind of weaponized against native people to pull us away from who we were. It was a tool of assimilation. And how it seems as though, because our people have always recognized the force that education is and can be for serving our people, it has shifted into a tool of reclamation. And so I would love to open up conversation um, with anyone who wants to jump in to talk about some of the work around reclaiming who we are through education, how we're supporting clearing that path back to who we are. Anyone want to jump in? Well, again, since I'm the oldest, <laughs> I, I guess I'll start off, but I want, I want to start off because I have that experience of being uh, taken away from my home as a child, six years old and kidnapped and putting into a boarding school where the culture was literally beat out of you or they attempted to beat it out of you. And I was always one of those girls that was always being punished and they would make the big girls punish you. And you would have to run through these gauntlets of you know, boards where they would hit you. And this is the truth. This is what really happened. And the big girls at nighttime would, you know, hold me and say, why don't you listen? Why don't you listen? And I, I absolutely just didn't like what I was being told. And so I think that, you know, was the birth of my passion, you know, uh, for our culture, because I was lucky to be raised, you know, by grandparents. And then, um, and then to, to come home and, and then see you know what my mother was doing in terms of uh, she was a union organizer and trying to obtain you know fair pay for our, our people who are working in the canneries and she always taught me you know that um, I have a responsibility you have a responsibility to work you know for your people and so I actually uh, started uh, as the director of the Alaska Native Brotherhood higher education program and it was to recruit kids to go to college and I would say, oh, that program was so good. I recruited myself and I went to college. <laughs> it was absolutely wonderful. I mean, and, and, and when I was ready to graduate, somebody said, why don't you go to graduate school? And, um, and I didn't even know what that was. And I, I kept saying, how in the world could they give me a degree when I don't even know, you know, I could barely, and when I have to, you know, read a book and have to, you know, put the definitions in the, col in the column and, it was, it was really a struggle for me. So I had all of that background. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing that with you because I think it helped shape, you know, the kind of things that uh, we started to do uh, when, when I took over um, the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. I was working at the university, teaching at the university at the time. And I got called in um, when uh, one of the directors, the, uh, a director left and, um, and then, and I just came in and just kind of was, you know, helping it uh, uh, stabilize. And then uh, they hired a new director and I, I got called, and that director resigned after a while. And so I was called back in again. So I called, I used to call myself the interim intermittent director. And I, I then I decided to stay. I decided to stay and we made language priority our highest, you know, priority. And uh, people used to, a linguist would describe our language as uh, moribund. So I said, 
that word will no longer be used to describe our languages. And I for, forbade everybody to use that word. And I'll tell you, we made a mistake. I ended up hiring five linguists and before long, I, they were studying the language and doing that. And we, we had ANLC, you know, to do that. So I fired all, all five of them. I said, this is not what we want. So it was really a learning experience about how do you integrate uh, language into the schools? And that was our first effort was language. But we also wanted academic, academic achievement. And um, so we, we had to start you know, integrating languages into our school. And I'll tell you, it was, I just didn't know where to start. We didn't have teachers. We didn't have any curricula material. Our schools weren't ready for us. Uh, we didn't have any programs. Uh, there was, I mean, Sea Alaska was great in terms of giving us the seed money, but we always had to go out and look for money. And when I started looking for money, I saw that all of the native education money was going to non-native entities. And I actually, you know, did an assessment and saw that native entities were only getting 17% of the native education monies. So I said, let's change that. And so we said partnerships, we're going to partners with schools and universities. So we started partnering and we got the uh, native monies raised up to about 30%. And I said, that's, that's not, that's not enough. So we went for the change and went for broke and said, let's just you know, give it to native entities. And uh, our thesis at the time was it really important for natives to be involved in education because we had a history of, of, of poor academic uh, performance by native students. There had been no change in the improvement of, of native education. And so we started to get involved in, in native education, not just in Southeast, because we changed the laws to, uh, to make, you know, to have those funds go directly to native entities. So that was the key thing, was having natives at, at, at the table in terms of the development of education for our students. And we evaluated every program that we did because we wanted academic achievement. And we said that integrating language and culture is a path towards improving academic achievement of our students. And we were able to prove that statistically. We were, you know, we did the evaluations and not only our own evaluations, I would actually hire outside evaluators because I didn't want people to say, oh, they're just saying that, you know? So we'd hire outside evaluators and, and, and we just proved, you know, that our, our engagement in education, our uh, integration of language and culture into our schools definitely was having you know, a, a powerful effect on our students. Uh, we started to have culture camps, you know, uh, to help our students uh, during the summer months. We created what we called language habitats. And I'll tell you, it was a learning lesson for me because, um, you know, in creating these language habitats, I think I started off with capoeira because, uh, you know, my grandson was in capoeira and I said, kids will love capoeira. So we introduced uh, language into capoeira. And then it was great, the kids loved it. But then summer ended and there was no capoeira program. And so I said, well, that didn't work. And so then we tried native games. Oh, our people have native traditional native games. And we brought people down from the interior. You would have thought I would have learned from the first experience, but I didn't. And so I brought native, our, our relatives down from the interior to teach native games. Kids love those native games. We were integrating language into uh, into our this daily these habitats. Well, they went home after summer. And so I said, now what? And my niece came to work for us and she says, Auntie, how about basketball? No, I didn't try to think of basketball. Our kids do that on a daily basis in all of our communities and everything. So it was a learning experience in terms of what we were doing. And the other thing was that was critical was these partnerships. We would establish partnerships with the school districts, uh, with the university. And I'm telling you, uh, you know, trying to achieve systemic change is, is, you know, part of that comes from being in the inside, you know, working with them, plus, you know, adding a couple of million dollars into their budgets also helps, you know. But it, it is constant work. 
Uh, we, you know, um, uh, I think I'd like to tell the story about, you know, one of the things that we're doing right now is with baby raven weeds, because we saw the books, you know, all the books we have, they all see, you know, Dick and Jane, all these other people that don't look like me and doing all kinds of other things that are not familiar with our people. So we started doing our own uh, baby raven books. And, um, and then we started to add in native languages. But the other component of it was having parental involvement. Because, you know, I had pulled together the teachers and I had asked them, okay, okay, teachers, tell me what's happening at Ground Zero. You know, what, why aren't our kids doing well in school? And um, they pointed to one of the things was that our, our parents weren't involved. And naturally, they had all been raised in boarding school, for goodness sakes, you know? And so, you know, learning about parental involvement in education was something that we had to teach, you know, uh, our, our generations of parents. And I will share with you that the, our baby ribbon reads uh, this last year, our students going into kindergarten, their uh, scores were improved by 20 points. Amazing. So I immediately wrote to our delegation and said, we have to adopt this at, you know, at, at a statewide level, if not a, a, a national level. So I think there are things you know, that we can teach about uh, improving academic uh, achievement of our students, increasing school retention, but at the same time, you know, teaching about our culture. And I will tell you, even though I love the Sea Alaska Board, I always tell them, our children are going to be so much better than we are because they are going to have a good education, plus they're learning about our culture right now. So, you know, I have great hopes for our future because we're gonna have educated uh, Native children who know about their culture, but are gonna become lawyers, anthropologists, anthropologists, anthropologist kids. <laughs> it's a great field. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, it's, it's been a journey. It's been a learning experience for us. I love that. And, you know, it's, it's no surprise that our, our peoples were experiencing poor academic achievement, right? When it's in a system that was measuring essentially how assimilated we were because there was nothing in the education that reflected our people or our knowledge, our values. So I love the, the infusion of who we are into what we're taught. And of course, our kids will start to thrive when they see the brilliance of where they come from reflected in, in our education. So I absolutely love that. Ashish. Building on what you were saying about the littlest ones, um, you know, Cook and Let Native Head Start, we, I sit on that board and we just completed um, an amazing building, totally, you know, I mean, we have fire pits in the classrooms, not real ones, but, you know, <laughs> they look like real ones. <laughs> um, it's designed with, you know, the natural uh, flora and fauna in, you know, different native languages. It's, I mean, it's all about who we are as native people. It's, it, it, and then the playground has got amazing, you know, animals and, you know, whales. And it's just, it's just an amazing place. And that is reclamation. That is taking, you know, who we are and reclaiming it and using it to help our littlest ones um, achieve not only obviously some cultural knowledge and grounding, but obviously setting them up for success. And, you know, we, you know, the Surrey Foundation has been partnering with Best Beginnings Alaska for a really long time, uh, supporting the zero to five work, because that is incredibly important. I mean, obviously, not only for Alaska Native kids, but all Alaskan kids. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we helped them do some Alaskanized um, board books I mean, I love the the baby raven books. Um, I've I've bought them for all my friends who have have little ones, and you know, it's it's really about it's looking at the whole lifespan of who we are and how do we help, um, you know, and and we can't do it all by ourselves. Obviously, we definitely have to partner, and there are partners out there who would like to work with us. And I think, um, you know, as Kahani was saying, it's like if you bring some money to the table, then they especially listen. <laughs> 
So it's kind of like our our situations have changed and um, you know, being able to work with folks and you know, it's it it is true that if you have some some resources, human and financial, you know, you can you can move through some things. And and the other thing that just I love, absolutely love, having been at the Surrey Foundation for a while, I get to see people move through their educational experience. I get to see them come out and start working in the world and making change. I mean, I look at IU and you know, I mean, I've known her a very long time. <laughs> And, and, and there are all kinds of other people uh, that I see that are doing amazing things. I mean, Raina Thiel comes to mind, uh, you know, and there are all kinds of, um, you know, leaders in our state and beyond who are foundation, you know, recipients, and it just makes my heart sing. Um, so it's, it's pretty amazing to see what's happened. And obviously, people have their own wherewithal, and they you know, they have to contribute to the success as well, but it's really connecting. Sometimes the Syriac Foundation is the only connection that people have to their native, um, you know, you know, personhood, you know, that's their only connection because they've never lived here. So it's been really wonderful to see that too, as people gain knowledge and seek knowledge. And some of them have actually moved home to Alaska. Mm -hmm. Um, because of the connection that they found. And that really makes me happy. I think that's a really good point, Susan, in terms of that connectivity, because you're right. You know, like we're often working with students who are 18, well, as they become higher ed or vocational students are 18 and 19 years old. So they may not have had a lot of connection with the native corporation yet because they've been kids <laughs> um, and so you know it, it can be their entry into really understanding you know what the native corporations are and what that relationship you know would be um, or is by you know the receipt of their scholarship and they they get curious they do you know we end up having conversations about like kind of what is this and you know like how do I qualify? And like, you know, oh, and where did these shares come from? So you, I think we do end up being kind of that that front door for this new generation who are um, really interested and curious, and you know, really want to know more about um, their um, yeah their heritage, but also you know the, the corporations themselves. Uh, I wanted to, I don't know if I'm, you know, allowed to ask questions, but okay, good. I did, you know, it was um, AFN this week. Kahani, you were on a really amazing panel um, with so many of the ISCA founders, including um, Roy Hendorf and many others and Willie Hensley. And there was a couple of things that you said during the panel that really just like, struck my heart and I wanted to ask you I was like oh I get the chance to ask about them <laughs> follow up but one of the, one of the things that you were talking about was um the critical nature of like enrolling descendants and like that this is you know work undone and that really does impact the education foundations because we as we work with descendants um, and as well as shareholders. And I wondered if you might just speak a little bit more about that tonight. Sure. And, and if you don't mind, what I think is important is to go back into the 1980s. And, and it's in the 1980s when Native people, our Native leaders, our Native people are beginning to see the flaws of INCSA. And uh, in, so in, 19, in 1982, I think, uh, the convention says that the 1991 legislation shall be our highest priority. In 1991, reference meant uh, reference that in 1991 the the restrictions on the sale of stock would be lifted, and so the great concern was the loss of our land. So in they convened uh, a several uh, leadership retreats and then five conventions just focused on the flaws of ANGSA. And so they, they came up with a series of recommendations for amendments. 
and one of them was land protection and corporation protections. So we could put our, our land into land banks and where they we wouldn't have to be fearful that we could lose our land through bankruptcy or lose it through taxes. But it was the other cultural dimensions that were so significant. And this is a statewide meeting, several meetings of native people from all over the state. And uh, they recognize land is important. And they say land is like, is like a relative. It, we view it as the same thing as we're connected to the land and we have spiritual relationship to the land. So land was uh, vital to us and our connection to the land. Then they said, we are group oriented. They called it communalism. And probably at that time, it might have scared people, you know, because they're so worried about communism. But they said, we are group, they're in saying communalism, they were saying, we are a group oriented people. And we know that the stock, the individual uh, stock to individuals was Congress saw that as a way to assimilate native people. And they figured with individual stock, they're gonna be able to sell their stock in 1991. And then we'll see this dissipation that the tribal mass it was, it was very much like the Indian land allotment where you would start to see individualization become you know, paramount. And then the other thing that they did was they said that Indian identity is tied to enrollment in native corporations. I mean, wasn't that significant that in the 1980s, you have statewide native people in convention saying that native identity is tied to enrollment into the native corporation because the enrollment means they have shares and they have ties to the land. And you have to go back to when they talked about land, the significance of land and how we, uh, we our culture is based on our relationship to the land. And ANGSA was all about land. And so in 1982, they see those flaws in ANGSA where children that were born after 1971 were not allowed to be enrolled in the corporations. And that was you know, the assimilationist policy that the government wanted. Secretary Hodel really fought, you know, he, he fought uh, the native community in these amendments. But in the end, you know, we ended up with that compromise because we wanted to have, at least I did, I wanted to have perpetual enrollment, just like how, uh, it, which replicates our tribal membership. It's perpetual. Our children don't have to be enrolled into our tribe. They are a member of our tribe because they are born into it, not because they inherited a, a stock. But that membership also ties them to the land. And so that's our traditional way. So anyway, we ended up having to compromise. And um, we had, so it says that native corporations have to have this uh, vote on a resolution. And uh, Sea Alaska, uh, you know, we, we had our first um, uh, 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 resolution to vote on enrolling uh, shareholders who were born after 1971. And we actually, you know, held a series of uh, uh, community meetings, uh, we held, uh, we, you know, I did demographic studies looking at our blood quantum projections and, uh, and I could see the sentiment you know, of our, our people. And also uh, we could see, we didn't want to, and that was the other thing in our 1991 amendments that our, our people were so, so great about in terms of saying we value elders. And so we want to be able to give them special benefits and in, in corporations, you have to give, what is that, non pro rata distribution. Everybody has to get equal distribution. But in our cultures, elders are valued. And we take care of elders. And that was, we have a lot of sharing mechanisms. It becomes our social security system in taking care of elders. So the corporations wanted to be able to give special benefits to the elders. So we had to amend, amend ANCSA so we could give special benefits to to elders, give them extra dividends. And we actually in uh, Sea Alaska gave them extra 100 shares. And um, so anyway, so I always say this native identity is so important. And the basis of na native identity is that tie to the land. 
And I, I feel very strongly about this. You know, I'm an anthropologist. I've done research all around uh, Alaska in the circumpolar Arctic. And, you know, I, you know so uh, I've had the benefit of learning about native cultures. And I will tell you, there are basic things that make us native. And one of them is that relationship to the land, uh, the special uh, real care for the elders and this group orientation that we have. Those are things that make us identify us as native people. And so if we disenfranchise the younger generation from having that tangible tie to the land, you know, then we run the threat. And this is my opinion, uh, my personal opinion and my studied opinion from, you know, studying native cultures for the last 40, 45 years. And I say that our children have a right to have that tangible tie to to the land and it happens through the corporations. And we are, I keep saying over and over again, native corporations are not just profit making corporations. I said, Congress said that we have a social, I'm sorry guys, I'm lecturing, <laughs> but <laughs> we have a social responsibility. And our people, our people have said, you know, it is the responsibility of native corporations, you know, to ensure that our culture survives. So, I, I, I will challenge anybody who says that native corporations are just for business and, and the only entitled, only benefit is our, our dividends. I mean, dividends are great. I love dividends myself, but, but it's more than that. I don't know if I answered your question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You did. Thank you very much. I think I, you know, I can't agree more or clap enough times when you were talking <laughs> because I, you know, I, I think we we feel that, and I know that there can be, I don't know, worry or concern about you know these unknown generations that are that are coming. But when I, you know, one of the best parts of our jobs, and Susan, maybe you get to do this too, is to read those scholarship applications. I always think, you know. If you're ever having a bad day, you just go and read a scholarship application because those students, I, I look at your face and it's this, you know, it's the same, right? They, they want to serve our communities. They want that tie. They're thirsty for that connection, um, you know, to our lands and to our people. And their driving desire is to give back always across the board. 100% of their students and I have yet to read a scholarship application that says that they want to be like you know um Steve Jobs or you know that they, they want to be the richest person in America that is not a goal it really is to um to give back to our communities and our and our native people and I I always just deeply appreciate that and I think we're going to be richer if everyone is included um, in, in some way as we move forward. Well, I'm, um, I'm so glad that you asked the question of Kahani and um, for the answer that she gave. And I wonder if, um, you know, kind of building off of this line of, of conversation, you know, what do we risk as a native community as um, as you know, even through the corporations themselves as um, holding on to that fee simple title to the lands, what do we risk if we um, don't connect our people to our homelands, if they don't know who they are as Native peoples, what is at risk? And, and this really is such a critical um, conversation, so I look forward to hearing your answers. Well, I, I've written a paper on it, and I said, uh, "Can I, and it was on blood quantum, and because we've done studies on on, um, on blood quantum, and I mean that's one another um, area that SHI is involved in, and that's research and research and, and uh, publications. We do scholarly research and scholarly publications, and we were looking at the Marine Mammal Protection Act, actually using that as the basis, and we looked at the blood quantum." because you have to be one fourth native blood uh, to be able to hunt sea mammals. And uh, I was in a meeting um, where I heard grandfather crying because he couldn't take his grandchildren 
out sea mammal hunting with him. And what happens if you are not able to teach your children uh, about hunting? And, and I keep saying land is the basis of our culture. When we utilize the land, it creates, you know, bonds between uh, the people who are go, go out hunting, the people they're sharing uh, the food with. It's the basis of our culture. And if our children can't go out marine mammal hunting, and if they cannot share their, their food, you know, with the elders, we, we begin to see, you know, uh, that deterioration of that social security system that I've talked about in terms of caring for the elders. We begin to lose the bonds between the, the elders and the youth. We begin to lose the bonds that are created when we're sharing, you know, our food. And ultimately, we will see the demise of our culture if we exclude our children. And the statistics show that it's happening. And um, there's not, there's not, I will say, say there's not a uniform solution because right now we know that the regions are different in terms of the rates of um, the, uh, the blood quantum change. And so uh, the native community has come up with uh, compromises in terms of, you know, how do we deal with it? And um, there, so it has to be, it's different for every region. And, and so I think, you know, the, at least in the Marine Mammal Protection Act, uh, we are making recommendations that we think right now that, you know, um, the way that it's, the recommendations are developed, we think it, it can pass, but that's only one element. The other element is that, you know, enrollment in native corporations like all of the participants to those uh, conventions in the 80s said that enrollment in Native corporations and that tie to uh, land will ensure, you know, the continued uh, protection of Native identity. And the statistics bear it out, you know. Well, I, um, you know, I was, <clears throat> I was thinking as you were speaking too about this connection between the cultural and heritage foundation work, as well as the connection to um, the corporations and the direct connection to our homelands. Um, one of the reasons that I, I ran to serve on our board for Sea Alaska was because looking down the road, if we, you know, thinking about if we don't have our people on our homelands, if they don't reconnect, if they don't have an opportunity to speak our languages, if they don't have an opportunity to know our cultural practices and our values and our protocols and be able to learn how to integrate them into, into their lives, um, into their work, into their communities, no matter where they live, if they don't have an opportunity to be on our homelands, at what point are we actually undermining the fiduciary stability of our ANCs? At what point are we actually undermining the, the, the success of being able to hold on to our lands? That's what these containers are in my mind, these corporations, a container, a mechanism by which we are able to hold on to um, a, a certain portion of our homelands, although the entire state is our homelands. Um, but one of the things that I think a lot about and care deeply about is how we reconnect our people to our homelands. Right. So many were taken away. Yeah. So many were taken and removed by both the boarding school processes and Kahani, thank you for sharing part of your story. I can't wait to hear more of it when you're, when you're willing and able to tell more of it. Um, but also through other federal policy eras of relocation um, and of you know, the termination era and so when I think about that, I think about the programs that you folks run, and I wonder about um, how are you bringing people back to their homelands? How are you reconnecting them back directly into that, that prime directive that we have as Native people? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, we have to remember what John Barbridge, one of the, uh, one of the leaders of ANCSA and certainly, you know, a great leader, from Southeast Alaska, um, he was the one that said that, that the fact that our people are living in our homelands 
you know, that's the basis of our strength for this Aboriginal land claim settlement was because our people were still living at home, still living on the land. He said that was the strength and a selling point, you know, to in Congress. Um, and right now, because of the unfortunate situations that, you know, in rural Alaska and predominantly in rural Alaska, where we don't have, you know, um, uh, the economic, the same kind of economic opportunities, we don't have the infrastructure, we don't, that can support, you know, um, um, economies. And so um, we, in my mind, you know, well, I will not say in my mind, we, I will say that we did, we actually did a study where we looked at the out migration from our rural communities. And there was uh, definitely, you know, the statistics show there is a trend of out migration uh, from our villages to the urban areas. And I will say that it's predominantly women who are leaving uh, our villages and, and uh, settling in, in the urban areas. And then, so you see the result, you know, the effects of that, that uh, out migration, there's a higher uh, rate of uh, intermarriage with non-native people. And so the, that building the economies in our homeland, I think is really important. And uh, having served on the Sea Alaska board for 30 some years and saying, what can we do to build economies in our communities? Well, we means we have to have people in the legislature that can support, you know, our, our development of infrastructure that can help us with energy costs, that can help us with VPSOs, making our villages safe, secure, and sound, so our and creating economic opportunities so that our people, you know, can continue to, to live in the village, allowing us to protect subsistence. And subsistence is so important, you know, and that's one of the unresolved issues that we have yet to take care of, you know, as a Native community, that we have to restore that Native subsistence priority because it's our tie to, to the land, but also it's the basis of our culture again. And, um, and so economically, we know that our people cannot sustain themselves from a subsistence economy 100%. We just know that but we do have the capacity just to have uh, mixed or dual economies. And so at least at Sea Alaska Heritage, one of the things that we're doing is we're, we're trying to help with sustainable, what we call sustainable arts. And what we did was we went back and looked at what were the arts, what were, how did people sustain themselves before there was you know, uh, uh, capital development projects. And so we started going back and teaching our people about um, uh, like spruce root basketry was almost extinct. And so we taught, you know, spruce root basketry. And I will tell you in one village, you know, we have 12 weavers and they're teaching their kids. And, the, and because we're promoting the arts and the, that's the other part of the heritage job is to promote the arts, not only for, you know, the cultural survival because it does have a spiritual uh, sacred dimension, but it also provides an economic opportunity. So we had to work on, on the marketing of the arts. We had to reintroduce some of the lost arts, but we also had to create economic opportunities, marketing opportunities, uh, you know, for, for the arts. And so that our people would, you know, have, have a place where they could sell. And I'll, I will tell you, that COVID really impacted our communities in many, many communities, you know, and, and I know you, you know, you know it firsthand, Liz, how it, you know, the, the price of food increased because transportation was sporadic and increased fuel costs. And it was, you know, not enough food, you know, commercial foods, and we had to depend on subsistence, just so many, and people losing jobs. COVID had an impact on our communities and our education that we have to address and keep before us. But you know, this thing about creating economic opportunities in our village is so crucial for us to remaining on the land. And, but also, you know, we have to protect the land too. And, and at Sea Alaska, we adopted a policy that talks about development, but protection of the environment, because you know, we've lived on this land for 10,000 years and we want to make sure that we can live off an, uh, for another 10,000 years. And, and if I can, I want to share 
uh, the story that um, Dolores Churchill tells us. She's a weaver, very famous basket weaver. And she was pulling the roots and she was saying, oh, how our ancestors must have loved us. Look at this. They didn't take all the roots from this tree, but they allowed this tree to live so that I could come here a hundred years later and pull roots from the same tree. But it's my responsibility to make sure that this tree lives so that future generations can continue to, you know, to come and harvest. So we have to do those kinds of, be mindful of our traditional values, but also we know that we are, you know, in many of our communities doing uh, industrial development. So we have to bring in the sciences and, and that's why we have to have our educated kids so that they could look at the impacts of, uh, of development and uh, mitigate or avoid those uh, environmental impacts. So it, it, it's all tied together, our traditions, our cultural values, our use of the land, our, our modern way of living off the land. So, but if uh, you, you ask a very, very important question is our people, you know, they have to be allowed to remain on the land and, you know, I call myself an urban subsistence user because it means I have to beg for subsistence food from my, my rural community relatives. So, uh, no, it's important. Well, Good question. And, you know, you're, I mean, I could listen to you all day and, and I think I would love to keep going. <laughs> I, and I think, I think the, the one challenging piece to that is we have folks who have never lived here. Yes. And they don't have the opportunity um, to be connected. And so I think what we're trying to do um, with some of the programs and opportunities that we have is to give an opportunity for them to connect in some way. And frankly, you know, COVID has been terrible for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I think the good thing that has come out of it is we've all learned how to do Zoom yes. <laughs> way better. And, you know, we, in the very beginning of this craziness, started partnering with different people, you know, the Alaska Native Heritage Center, you, you know, all kinds of folks, and Zoom classes on how to carve, um, you know, ivory carving, wood carving, um, fish skin work, um, which has also come back, you know, um, in the since about I think 2014 might've been the first time that we did something with Fishkin, but the same thing, it's revived. I mean, it's all over the place now, um, you know? And so that's the thing we, we can connect in ways now that we haven't had the opportunity to do and, and bringing people in again and connecting them. And, you know, I love, you know, the language um, opportunities that, that you've got, you've been offering. And um, obviously the, we were talking before we went on the, um, uh, moccasin sewing classes. So it's like, there's just, um, there's a lot of different ways to, to learn and to be, and to be connected. And I think that's the most important thing to remember is, you know, the reason we're still here after 10,000 plus years is because we've figured things out. We've innovated our way. <laughs> we've innovated our way through it. Um, and so using all the tools and that have, you know, been developed along the way. And I think, you know, education is definitely one of them. Um, and it, you know, I think the opportunities that we have are pretty amazing, but there's still a lot of work to do. There really is. Um, and we know that. Um, I am, I am buoyed though by, again, reading those scholarship statements, um, reading people's thank you notes, uh, reading comments from from the cultural classes um, or events or activities that people have participated in. I mean, it's, it really, you, when you see someone's life literally change because of something that, you know, you had a little teeny, teeny, tiny part of, it, it's pretty amazing. This last summer, um, BBNC, and we had meant to do it two summers ago, but COVID. So this last summer was our first year. Um, of a our, our first ever um, BBNC Bristol Bay um, culture camp 
and uh, which we held just outside of Igiagig in the lake region in Bristol Bay and it was uh, an activity that we're the Education Foundation and BBNC are partnering in for high school aged youth, uh, both from outside, you know, and from Anchorage and from region to come together and spend a week um, with elders. And because we have um, three cultural groups in our region with Adena, Ina, Alutik, and Yupik, we had um, elders from all, although our Alutik elder could not make it at the last minute, um, but we had language teachers in all, in all the groups. And it was a beautiful week long experience for all of them to be in community together, on the land together, some of whom who had never been into, even though we're from Bristol Bay, had never been in region before. Um, and also for those students to be able to teach each other um, and the relationships that I think were created during that week was were amazing. We also had um, college age interns that were there as the counselors. And I think that they were equally, they equally benefited, um, equally just, um, had that enriching experience of being able to connect like really deeply with who they are in a way that only comes when you're outside and on the land with each other and doing traditional activities and they, they, they cut fish, they harvested berries, they did salves, they um, carved lamps. They kept them very, very busy <laughs> morning to morning to night <laughs> um, every day. And we're really looking forward to to that um, opportunity for next year. And we also see it as a way for students um, to get to know each other. Right. These are future leaders from our communities and they're going to build these relationships that I think that they'll take with them, you know, all the way, you know, 20 years from now, I hope they're on the BBNC board of directors, you know, and they'll think back at their their time at camp and those connections that they made um, to their communities. I did want to touch on something that um, Kahani had noted in early in your remarks around the number of the migration that's happening from communities and into um, urban areas. And what struck me about it was that you noted that it was primarily women. And we did some research at the Education Foundation, went back and looked at all of our scholarships from the beginning um, and did some you know, analysis of those scholarships. And we actually found that for the higher education scholarships, that it is 76% women that receive those um, scholarship awards and are attending college. And I think that's really important for us to, to think about and talk about um, because, you know, our Alaska Native men also, you know, as you noted, um, need to have access into these, you know, into careers that do require some, you know, post-secondary um, degrees. And that I think means a more of a focus around um, vocational careers where we may have not put as large of a focus in, in the past around the really good jobs that are uh, that are in communities that are super critical, like construction and electricians and plumbers and the things that we need, um, you know, to make sure that the generators stay on and working and all of those, those careers and how can we as education and cultural foundations really increase the emphasis there um, around and provide the funding, honestly, to support those, um, you know, the training in those areas because it's super critical and also very expensive. If you're interested in becoming a pilot, if you're interested in going to like, you know, becoming an aviation mechanic, you know, that is $30,000 and you have to come up with it up front before they even will enroll you in some of the programs, right? And so, uh, you know, joining together with multiple organizations, uh, I think in a community to fund a single student, just to make sure that they can get through those um, you know, career paths very quickly and, um, and, you know, get back home into the job that they want, I think is really, is really critical. So I think that that's one way that we can, as education and cultural foundations, support economic development in communities is by providing the, you know, the needed resource. So, you know, we educate a student who can, um, go home and get that job, um, 
you know, at the power plant or wherever they want to be. So I think that's a really concrete, <laughs> important thing that we can do. It is an ongoing uh, thing. I mean, for a long time, um, it's 60, 40, 70, 30, you know, with the Surrey Foundation with men um, being the lower number there. And it's, um, you know, we've looked at that and we do fund, you know, technical training and vocational training and any, I mean, basically any, um, you know, anything with a certificate, um, you know, along those lines. So it's, and it's, it's a national statistic as well. Uh, more women going to higher that had higher ed than men or, you know, going on to post-secondary. And it's just, there's a, a lot of varying reasons, you know, that go into that on a national level. And I think, you know, obviously in our communities, I think it is harder for men sometimes to pick up and leave and, you know, or, or maybe they are, they're not um, feeling like they are prepared to do that or interested in, in that, but um, it's an ongoing challenge, you know, and, and trying to be supportive of that and trying to offer the different opportunities and different funding, obviously, because it is really expensive. Um, I mean, any kind of education really is these days. It's, it's kind of off the charts. But that's where I think partnering comes in and making sure people know the opportunities that they have available to them. Because a lot of our folks, um, you know, they, they're eligible through um, a wide variety, maybe, I mean, one, two, three different organizations, Native organizations. And, you know, we also publish the Education Resource Handbook that's, um, you know, got all kinds of different opportunities for scholarships and grants in it. So um, it, it takes some work to piece the funds together. And, uh, but, but, you know, people can do it and, but it does take some work and it takes a little guidance and help. So people don't get themselves up a creek um, with a bunch of loans and, you know, those kinds of things. Cause that's, that's really hard. Um, you know, for people to deal um, with too. We, we did a study um, looking at the differential rates of change between men and women. And we, you know, we saw the same things, you know, that women were getting educated uh, in our region. It was at twice the rate as, um, as Native men. Uh, we looked at the incarceration rate and saw that, is, that, that the increase in Native incarceration has actually increased. I mean, it's, it's like, 38% now, maybe going to 39%. And of that population, 98% of them are Native males. Uh, we know that Native men are committing suicide at a higher rate uh, than uh, the highest rate in the country. Um, it's among uh, young Native males. And we looked at all of those things and we called, uh, we have a council of traditional scholars. And so we called them together and said, okay, guys, what happened? Um, you know, our men used to be powerful uh, warriors. They were powerful entrepreneurs. You know, we had healthy societies. What happened? And, and what should we do about it? So they, you know, they started talking about, you know, the traditional training. And uh, in, our, in our region, there was one, one practice where young men would have to go into uh, the bays, the waters, and they'd have to stay there while the tide went out and came back in. And explorers used to come to our country and they, they say they would turn into a bay and they would see hundreds of young men, you know, in, in that water. And it was teaching them strength of body, mind, and spirit. And it was holistic in, you know, that, that training. Then they would, you know, uh, come out of the water and the women would hit them with switches. And that, that was that, what the missionaries copied, you know, with those, those uh, boards that they used to hit uh, the naughty children with. They said, oh, they used to do that traditional practice. And they, they would have other kinds of training, you know, uh, physical training. And they said there were other things like men have, would have to wear something on their ear to remind them it was their responsibility to take care of the community was their responsibility as men. So um, we started what we call our Fatsin, Fatsin camps, Fatsin leadership camps, where we 
try to reintegrate some of those traditional training, you know, that the men that were mostly for men. And when we first started, you know, we hardly had any, any men in, in those Tlatsin camps, but now it's 50-50. And uh, so we know, we know it's helping, we know that it's working. And you, you know, you just might want to take a look at some of your the traditional training um, that uh, young men underwent, you know, in your region. But that's some of the things, you know, uh, that we're trying to do right now in, in dealing with that differential, you know, rates of what we see between uh, Native men and, and Native uh, women. You know, we we found um, something similar in just recent hiring over the last couple of years. You know, we get to do really incredible work at First Alaskans Institute, and, you know, we've worked really hard to encourage amazing folks from all over the state, men and women, to apply for the different kinds of roles that we um, have available from time to time. Um, but it really was our um, Indigenous Stewardship Fellowship that, you know, really incredible men felt very drawn to. And I think that it is indicative of what you're talking about, Kahani, that our, our men really are drawn to um, opportunities that allow them to step into the fullness of their role as protectors of our families, of our communities. Um, as you were talking, I was, I was thinking also about um, you know, kind of linking back to the earlier part of our conversation about um, helping the education system itself to reflect our people's values and the things that we find important and the roles that we find important. Log and I and I had an opportunity to travel to Aotearoa um, maybe about nine years ago. Um, and we spent time in the Te Wanaha o Aotearoa, which is a post-secondary tertiary institution that is uh, was founded by Maori for Maori peoples, um, but about half of, at that time, about half of the 33,000 students um, were non-Maori. And they were unapologetic in um, centering Maori knowledge and ways of being in the ways that they um, would educate do educate, they, they still do this. Um, and so they, you know, in creating institutions that were by them and for them were privileging our, you know, indigenous people's ways of knowing. And so they created degrees around wayfinding, you know, ocean, ocean navigation by the stars, um, Maori weaving and, and so many other really incredible um, vessels of indigenous knowledge um, that others might tuck under the umbrella of culture when really we know that it's knowledge. Our language is knowledge. We know that our arts are knowledge. And so um, anyway, I was thinking about, you know, the ways of our indigenous peoples across the globe creating education systems that are for us and by us. And, you know, I see a lot of movement in that direction here in Alaska. We've got um, our first tribal college in Utkiarvik, Elisarvik College, unapologetically in Ipiak. We've got Alaska Pacific University, now a tribal university. You know, we're seeing at all levels of the education system our peoples taking over the kind of um, training and education that we want our people to have. So what I wanted to, to open up the floor on recognizing that we're already like at the final lap <laughs> of our conversation, this time has gone by so fast. I wanted to, to pull on the thread a little bit about the unfinished business that you guys were talking about. What are some of the things that are on the horizon that will be the next chapter of how we support the thrival of our peoples through our cultural and heritage institutes? Well, I think, you know, the next, I think it's unfinished business. Um, Alaska Pacific University is not technically a tribal college quite yet, but we're working on it. I happen to be on the board, <laughs> but we're getting there. We're working on it. Um, you know, there's a lot of work to do in, in the education area. Um, I think as we heard, you know, during AFN, I think as we've been talking here, there's a lot of opportunity to make change there. 
there's, um, you know, out in uh, Chickaloon, you know, the Yanni Da'a school has been going on for quite a long time and we've been um, supporters of that. And it's a labor of love as well as a complete and amazing um, perseverance and fortitude. And, and it's surrounded, I mean, it's just, it's because the love of their kids and, um, you know, that they're teaching in the way that, that they want them to learn. And uh, I've been, I haven't had a chance to visit lately, but when I did go out there, I mean, it was amazing. Um, I mean, you hear the kids and you watch the videos and, you know, they're singing, they're dancing, they're doing their lessons, um, you know, and, and then, you know, it's, I mean, it's amazing. Um, it gives me goosebumps. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps right now. That can be, there can be way more schools like that. The Alaska Native um, Charter School also doing a really amazing job in a different way, um, you know, working with and for our students, obviously down in Southeast, um, you know, but there's a lot of work we can left to do. Um, I do think though that, that, that there are more people coming who are motivated and inspired and, you know, they're coming through the, the Western educational system and they've made it their own and they have, you know, they've taken what they needed and wanted from it and they've, you know, they've made something new and different that is going to be powerful and useful, um, you know, on behalf of our people. So I'm actually pretty optimistic, surprisingly so, but I'm... <laughs> But I am. <laughs> and I have really, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed listening to everyone this evening. And then I've, I've had a few ideas spark from what everybody has said. So I'm going to be emailing and, or Zooming with you soon. Hopefully we can maybe do some more things together. So Ganesh. Well, I, I hate to be, you know, to bring us down uh, because I think, you know, I'm optimistic about the future too, but I think uh, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up, you know, a major concern that we have about our students, you know, coming out of this COVID and, and the fact that so many of them, you know, were, uh, were not able to attend school, that were, you know, learning over the internet and, uh, and now returning back to school, we have definitely seen, you know, a decrease uh, in that academic gain that we had. Uh, so we know that our students, Native students, predominantly Native and minority students were affected by the closure of schools. And uh, so we have an academic problem. But we also have the emotional, psychological problem and where we're seeing higher rates of self-harm right now. Uh, we haven't been able to document all of the suicides, but we do know that we've had suicides, but we've also seen you know, uh, self-harm, evidence of self-harm among an increasing number of our students. So the message that I keep trying to um, give to uh, particularly uh, our congressional uh, delegation, is that this pandemic relief is, is, can't be just for one year, but we're going, we are going to be dealing with the long-term effects of the closure of schools. And I think we have to put that, you know, I definitely, every time I talk to the delegation, I said, you can't, you know, uh, do that just for one year. And I know that they put, you know, they did put some educational money. Unfortunately, the native money went into uh, the state budget and we were not able to get that state, that, that money that was uh, meant for uh, native entities under the Alaska Native Education Program. So I keep telling, you know, the delegation, we are going to need support in the long term to uh, deal with the academic uh, loss, that losses that we, that we are experiencing. Plus, you know, this, this, the emotional problems that our children are now facing. We have tried, you know, to get more counselors in uh, that are in working with the, with the students, not in, not sitting in their, in their, um, in their offices. So we've been pushing, you know, for retraining of counselors 
uh, so that they're not just sitting in their office, but they're trying to figure out where I want to go where the students are. So I just want to bring this up as a very real, discrete problem that we have in the Native community. And we are going to need help, you know, from, uh, and I, I always say, I'm always leaning on the federal delegation because we just haven't had that kind of funding, you know, for uh, our educational special needs uh, for Native and rural communities from the state. And we we're very fortunate in my mind that we have a good delegation that has supported, you know, us in particular, I see it in uh, the cultural things and in the educational things. But I just had to throw that out there. I just, you know, want it, you know, to keep that at the forefront along with all of these other wonderful things that are truly happening in our communities. Absolutely, Kahani. I mean, I, I think that the families, you know, the families and the students um, who have lived through this past time, recent time, um, it's, Everyone was trying to do the best that they could do under the circumstance. And now we need to support them as we all try and figure out how to come out of this, but especially as you were saying, for, for the kids and, and the families, you know, and, and the caregivers of, of those kids, because it's, they, you know, they didn't, it, it, through, it was through no fault of their own that any of this happened, obviously. And, I like to, to think of it as, you know, to, um, to think about the other things that they did learn as well during this time and, and maybe reframe, reframe it a little bit because I know that there were losses, but I also know that, um, you know, they were able to hopefully, you know, have some opportunities maybe to spend some more time doing some different things and learning in different ways, you know, through maybe some of the culture kits that, that you sent out or some other kinds of things, you know, and, and I know it's, I know there's, I know there's some tough things and some sad things um, that are also real and we're going to have to deal with them. Um, I'm thinking about how do we all work together on those and identifying those. So that's actually one of the things that I want to, I want to talk with you all about. So I'm writing that down. <laughs> I think it's a really good point, and especially for students who have any kind of, um, you know, special needs that, you know, that predated the pandemic. If, you know, you were working in speech therapy or any kind of, uh, you know, therapy or, you know, had an ILP in school, I think if there were many parents just because of logistics that you know couldn't have their students participating in those activities and so it's critical you know that we recognize that and give extra assistance now for those students as we as they come back to the classrooms and um, work with students you also um kahani reminded me of you know the serious nature of um teaching and teachers in Alaska. And I know you all have, um, Kahani, have done some spectacular work in, um, in Southeast and really encouraging Indigenous teachers. Um, and I think it's, you know, we all as the state have benefited from that. Um, but, I, and I think more, we have more to do, um, you know, as we create good environments for our students to return to the classroom. Um, it is making sure that we have, um, you know, those loving, caring adults, and I think more indigenous, indigenous teachers in our communities that are going to be there and stay um, in their in their schools. I, I do think that there is um, work to be done at the state level because, you know, in talking with our superintendents from our Bristol Bay region, we have four school districts in the region, um, you know, they're there was an ability to retain teachers year on year because of the you know, the kind of excellent retirement benefits and um, that were offered by the state of Alaska. And you know what I understand from learning from them is that a lot of that has gone away. And so um, the desire of people to commit to a long term to a teaching career has changed, and that is. That's an issue that every Alaskan, I think, we all need to come together to, you know, to talk about and and to address because it's our students 
that suffer. And when I try to explain this in the, the corporate environment, I know at least one of our districts that, you know, they'll have a year on year turnover rate of, you know, 30 to 40% of the teaching staff will turn over in a single year. And I say to any of us, you know, if you're if you've turned over 40% of your staff in a single year, you know, how can you expect, you know, like, how do you create a functional work school environment? Um, that's, to me, in my mind, that's an emergency. And if we don't, you know, address it, then how are we going to, you know, students aren't going to get to post secondary, right? <laughs> so I, you know, I, I think that's a critical question that we should um, ask ourselves. And then, you know, I feel like I've taken the master class tonight. So thank you very much. I too have been really thinking, and you know, I, I have, we have so much. To, I have so much to learn um, in terms of the um, the things to try. But also, I really feel really good. You know, Kahani, when you're saying it's like you tried some things and they didn't work, and then you tried something else. <laughs> You know, I think that you know, that's a that's a really good motto. And we've been doing some dreaming about school environments and how we want that school environment to be in our K twelve um, in our K twelve system. And in our in our dream world, it's it's this idea that there's there's cultural there's a there's cultural education and then there's the western education elements and in the school these are equally powerful or you know cultural heritage always maybe a, a more powerful in informing how that western education is um is communicated and taught in the school environment and there's we're really trying to dream about how we can um bring that to reality um, in with our district. So it does give me hope. I feel like, I, I feel like there is, because um, we have really good partners. You know, and I, I really wanted to, th to thank the, you know, the many folks who are working in the education system in, in Bristol Bay, because I think that they're amazing. Um, so we're really looking forward to, you know, futures with them. So I think I think we will know when we're when we're making progress when we have you know an Alaska Native governor, an Alaska Native senator, an Alaska Native you know um, you know more more Alaska Native people on all kinds of different boards, um, you know more Alaska Native superintendents. Um, there's just there's some opportunities, and I think I think we will. I think we, I know we are on our way. Oh, goodness, Chish, how, uh, I don't want our time to end. Um, this whole conversation was, was about the, you know, the education and cultural foundations that were, were, um, you know, born out of ANCSA and, and, but something was said here tonight that I think is really critical. And it, it is this. It was not born out of angst. It was born out of our people. Our people were the ones at that decision-making table, and they decided that this needed to happen. And I think we give a lot of credit. We always give a lot of credit to you know these external forces when, in fact, you know, angst uh, was shaped largely by so many of our leaders in terms of the fight for our lands a fight for our lands and then inside those corporate boards a fight for who we are as native people to be connected to those lands and that's what gave birth in in terms of the story told here tonight um that's what gave birth to these education and cultural foundations that you folks have been um leading um for uh for many years um, on an intermittent interim basis, <laughs> <laughs> on a permanent basis on, for five years. And um, as you were all talking, I was one of the things I was thinking about was wanting to ask you guys kind of a, um, maybe a, um, a fun 
question to close our time out. Um, we've talked about lots of really important and serious and hard issues in terms of the, the scope and breadth of the work that you all do. I don't think that a lot of people have a lot of trans, you know, like understanding of just the complexity of the work, the depth of the work um, through the foundations. But um, I guess just to close our time out, I wanted to ask you each this question, which is, you know, do you sample your own product? What classes do you take that your foundation is supporting and creating? You know, are you, are you, did you take a fish skin tanning class if you supported it? Um, did you take a moccasin class? You know, like, are you taking language classes? Like how, how are you yourself being reinforced and indigenized through the work that you're offering to your community? How are you also receiving that? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask each of you to respond as we, as we look to close out our time together. Well, I use the Alaska Heritage Institute's um, dictionaries and uh, publications all the time. I look at them and I, you know, listen to the, you know, I'll read them and then I'll listen to the um, pronunciation. So uh, I do want to take an actual class, which I have not done yet, but I'm going to, I, I was actually looking on, you know, to see where and when, when, when would be available. So um, but I do use your publications a lot, Connie. <laughs> I do. Those classes are coming. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to look. I'm going to do that. And we actually use our, I use our publication, how to put up fish um, on the Kenai all the time with the recipe in it. I love that book. You gifted it to me. <laughs> I think it's on the shelf back here. Um, I was looking and I, I, it's not here right now, but through the Ed Foundation, we funded the Pacific Northwest Aleutic Culture Camp, who went all virtual and offered many, many classes online. And it was amazing because we got to connect with Aleutic Nation diaspora from around the country. We had people zooming in from Denver and back east and no matter where they were. And we, um, with uh, Hannah Scholl carved oil lamps, which was really amazing. And I wish I had, I kept it on my desk, but I cleared it off and put it downstairs. Um, but I think that the thing that, it was over a month that we carved these lamps and we kind of um, came together on Sundays and talked about the process that we were going through. And it was a really meaningful experience um, for I think everybody that participated in that in the class. And what I took away from it was, you know, they gave you the soapstone and it wasn't, you know, it came square and very hard <laughs> and the tools, <laughs> um, you know, and you could get a Dremel, you know, to make it easier or they gave you the hand tool. So I just chose to carve with my hand tool. And just carving and carving and carving just like one scoop at a time. And I got to the point in my lamp where there was like this imperfection, like there was a little stone in the middle of the lamp and I was really trying to dig it out, <laughs> you know, just trying to get to it. And it never would move. I couldn't, I couldn't move it. And I just, um, you know, continued to get it, you know, deep enough to hold, to hold the oil and shaped the way I want it. And then in the end, I, I felt like, you know, a lot of you know me on this column, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Like one of my calling cards and i thought this is my lesson that is being gifted to me is that this is not about perfection right this is this is just the way it's supposed to be and um and so i i left it and i said i sanded it down and put the oil on it so it would be ready and we came together and um to light the lamps for the first time we did it as a group and we sang the blessing song um, as we did it. And then I realized when I put my 
wick in there in the lamp that it was the spot that I was supposed to put the wick on <laughs> that it would actually had a function I just hadn't you know really embraced it yet and so it was perfect it you know it was perfect in the end so I really appreciated the camp um, for that so and I would I would show it to you right now but I I'll send you it later. <laughs> I, I was thinking long and hard, what do I participate in, you know? <laughs> and the only thing I could think of is that I buy Native art from our artists. <laughs> if you come to my house, you'll see my house. Kids think it, my house is like a museum. And then I've got so many earrings that you know, I've got a whole dresser full of earrings, so that's the way I participate, is, is buying art and jewelry from the artists, so, but I do want to share one story, though, and it, we have, we have this first Friday, and it's open to the community, you missed it, you, and uh, Liz is on our board of trustees, and, and, um, so, and, and I told you our, our, one of our goals is to promote cross-cultural understanding. And we, and so we were having our first Friday and I was sitting in the back watching all the kids dance. And here comes along this Tanik Gleika white boy. And he was dancing four years old. Oh, whoa, whoa, just like, you know, and I, I was so happy. And I told uh, our Calder staff, look, look, at, we're doing our job. We're promoting cross-cultural understanding. This four-year-old boy was just dancing and dancing, so almost fell off the ledge. So uh, anyway, that, that's what I participate in, jewelry, art, and then being able to watch some of our programs and the kids in our programs. So good. You know, our, our Native art, our Native jewelry, um, the, the practice of bringing these things back, like all of it is such good medicine. Um, yeah, I absolutely love that. I was kind of giggling, Alicia, as you were sharing, because um, I, was, I was reflecting on how um, across the entire state, from region to region, our peoples are inspiring each other and igniting this fire of awakening who we are and what that looks like. Um, I was in a class with Kunak, Marjorie Tabon, who actually this is her birthday today. And he was in the Mountain, Kunak, if you're out there. Um, she um, was one of the ones who was helping to bring the practice of carving our fluid, our seal oil lamp speak. And Hannah Scholl was in the same class that I was in. And she was preparing for the classes that she was going to teach. And so, um, you know, our, our peoples were coming together in that, that sacred space that you were describing and we were carving together. And I actually was able to have my kids help me carve mine as well. And so I was just asking my panic to go and grab mine so that I could show it because I know you were talking about it. So um, this was mine. It was revealing itself to me as I was carving it. I, I wasn't really sure um, how it was going to, to shape out, but I had that same thing happen <laughs> with the one little rock that was right there that I was really trying to get out of there. But then when I um, put it together, I realized that that has a really important function as well in keeping the wick up there. So um, anyway, I just wanted to share that with you because um, our people have a yearning to be whole. We have a yearning to connect with our cultural knowledge and to awaken within us the ways of our people and help that be medicine not only for us but for our world and so i i just feel so inspired for spending this time with all of you and also just want to say Thank you so much for all that you do to help clear the path back to who we are for our people in all the ways that you do it, in all the ways that you inspire, invite, 
and connect our people. Just really want to lift you up and, and say and thank you. Thank you for this time together. We know that we'll have many more. It sounds like it sounds like we're planning more <laughs> connection points, but for now we love you, Klanakbak, and thank you to your families for allowing you to be in this space with us as well. Uh, and I wanted to share that all of these beautiful pieces here <laughs> were all made um, during some kind of uh, either Journey to What Matters or Heritage Project grant um, activity. So that's why we like to use the background made by Olivia EY um, oh, on our team. She's also a recipient. So um, it's just I get to look at this and then I get to look at all of you and I'm like, it really makes me happy. So Beautiful. And thank you, Ganeshish, for all the work that you do, Maganai and Ayu. Ganeshish, how uh, I, um, I was just um, cracking up about Alicia's comment earlier because I was like, I think we just need to start doing this like, um, we'll just continue just having these master classes. <laughs> it's so needed and it's so good for us. I always think about how smart our ancestors were, you know, that the wisdom of how we taught our people is a wisdom that our school systems ab absolutely need. And, and it will be so good for all of the students in those systems. That wisdom of knowing that, um, that you tell a story over and over again. And as the person grows and has experiences in life, they will take something and learn something new from that story at every single different point. Yes, I love it. Did someone just type ancest ancestor class? Yes, yes, it's gonna happen. Um, and that we, we, create, we create the environments for our, our peoples to thrive. And, you know, that's the work that you folks have been engaging in. And we've been, we've been doing it despite the fact that there are so many um, systemic issues that are working uh, in opposition to that. And it's so amazing what our people do every day. And um, I think a lot about this, this quote, and I always seem to mess it up. Um, but it's, um, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And when I think about the statistics that people often quote to talk about our people, I think about how our people aren't well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. That's what those disproportionate disproportionalities are telling us, that our people are not well adjusted to a society that harms them. And that's good. And that's a strength that we have. And that the, the muscle and the, um, the ability for them to, to be well adjusted is to be well adjusted to a society that loves them. That's where they're going to be strong. And that's where we're going to thrive. And that's, that's the environment that you folks are trying to create and, and are adding and contributing to. And I, I want to close um, our time um, with this simple quote that I've loved ever since I've heard it. And it was from um, Benny Shendo, who's Jemez Pueblo. He's a, a state senator in New Mexico, who shared it with our brother Bentham um, Ohia, who is um, Maori from Aotearoa, um, and uh, who credits our Alaska Native people for the very education system Ayu was talking about down in Aotearoa. They came to learn from our Alaska Native people about the indigenous way of thinking and educating. And Oscar Coagley was actually one of their most inspirational um, uh, folks that they look to amongst many others to help them kind of think through how to design a, a university system that reflects their people. But this quote is really simple. Um, Don't teach me about my culture, use my culture to teach me. Hmm. And I feel like that's something that you folks are pressing the, 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 ter the boundaries and pushing at the boundaries, you know, 
um, to continue to create those environments where, where our children and our children's children will, will thrive and will be well-adjusted in a society that profoundly loves them and has the high expe expectations of them once again. So, goodness, cheese, how, uh, um, Guyana, Guyana, um, Chucknock, so much for your time tonight, for your words, for your stories, for your laughter, for your warmth. Um, and, um, we will see you folks again. Uh, we want to thank those of you who joined us um, watching the live stream tonight. We're super um, grateful and cannot thank you enough. Uh, you folks have a good night. Bye, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.